Chapter Twenty of On the Trail of the Space Pirates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humpel. On the Trail of the Space Pirates by Carrie Rockwell. Chapter Twenty. I don't care if the blasted ship blows up," roared Captain Strong to the power deck officer of the Solar Guard rocket cruiser Arcturus. I want every ounce of thrust you can get out of this space heap. The young Solar Guard captain turned back to the loudspeaker of the audio receiver, turned the volume dial a fraction, and listened. The steady pronounced ping of Roger's signal beacon filled his ears. When Strong discovered that Coxine had outwitted him, he had gone aboard the rocket cruiser Arcturus of Squadron 10 and had continued on search patrol. He dared not break audio silence to warn the cadets aboard the Polaris, lest he give away the position of the ship. Later, when the radar officer of the Arcturus reported a steady signal over the audio receiver, Strong at first dismissed it as some sort of interference from space. But when Titan failed to report the arrival of the Polaris on time, Strong investigated the strange sound. Taking a bearing on the signal, he discovered it came from a position dangerously close to the small Jovian colony of Ganymede. After repeated attempts to raise the Polaris failed, and no distress signals had been received, Strong feared that Bull Coxine had won again. In a desperate effort to catch the criminal, he took repeated bearings on the signal and ordered full emergency space speed toward the small satellite of Jupiter. Contacting Commander Walters at Space Academy, Strong related his suspicions and received permission to carry out a plan of action. "'I want you to engage the enemy at all costs,' ordered Walters. "'Blast his space-crawling hide into protons. That's an order.' "'Yes, sir,' replied Strong with grim determination. "'There's nothing I'd like better.' Six hours later, Strong received confirmation of his worst fears. He was handed a message that read, "'Emergency.' Ganymede garrison attacked zero three hundred hours by two ships, one vessel identified as rocket cruiser Polaris. Send aid immediately. Entire colony at mercy of Coxine. Signed, Summers, Major, Solar Guard. Strong realized at once that the cadets had been forced to give the recognition code to the pirate. There wasn't any other way for the pirate to penetrate the defenses of Ganymede. And, thought Strong bitterly, to blast Coxine was to blast the cadets as well. The commander's words echoed again in his ears. Blast him, Steve. That's an order. Strong turned to his second in command. Man all guns. Stand by to attack under plan S. We'll engage the enemy as soon as he's sighted. The young officer saluted and turned away quickly. But not before he saw the mist in Steve Strong's eyes. Tom, Roger, and Astro watched the incredible scene taking place in front of them with unbelieving eyes. Seven men were standing at rigid attention on the control deck of the Avenger. Wallace, Russell, Atardi, Harris, Shelley, Martin, and Brooks. In front of them, standing equally rigid, Bull Coxine was addressing them in a low, restrained voice. Raise your right hands and repeat after me. The men raised their hands. I hereby pledge my life to Bull Coxine. I hereby pledge my life to Bull Coxine, repeated the men in unison, to uphold his decisions, obey his orders, and fulfill his purpose of destroying the Solar Alliance and establishing a new governmental order. The seven men repeated the words slowly and hesitantly. All right, said Coxine. From this day on you are my chief lieutenants. You will command the ships of my fleet, and when we destroy the power of the Solar Guard and take over the Alliance, you will help me rule our new order. The seven men looked at each other, raised a mild cheer, and waited as Coxine shook hands with each of them. All right, said Coxine abruptly, as he reached the end of the line. Get to your ships and prepare for full acceleration. We go into action immediately. The men filed from the room silently, each with a worried look on his face. Coxine failed to notice their lack of enthusiasm, and turned to the three cadets. "'Some day, boys,' he said, "'you'll go down in history as being the first witnesses to the establishment of the new order.' Astro glared up at the giant spaceman. "'We'll be the witnesses to the biggest bust in the universe when the Solar Guard catches up with you.' "'Yeah,' drawled Roger in his most casual manner. 
You're the one that'll go down in history, Coxine, as the biggest space-gassing idiot that ever blasted off. Tom suddenly guffawed. Though close to death, he couldn't help laughing at Roger's remark. The big spaceman flushed angrily, and with the flat of his hand slapped the cadet across the face. Then he turned to the teleceiver and opened the circuit to all the ships that were standing by in space around the Avenger, the ships of the Ganymede garrison. "'Stand by for acceleration,' he called. "'We're going to show the Solar Alliance who's boss, beginning right now. I'll give you the target in a few minutes, but head in the direction of Earth.' He faced the three cadets and sneered. "'By the time I'm finished with Luna City, the only thing active will be radioactive.' Suddenly Gus Wallace could be heard screaming over the teleceiver, his face a mask of fear and panic. "'Bull! Bull!' he shouted. "'The Solar Guard! We just spotted them! Squadrons! Heading straight for us! We've got to get out of here!' "'What?' roared Coxine, turning to his radar scanner. The blips on the screen verified the alarm. He shouted into the teleceiver. "'Man your guns! We'll wipe them out right now!' "'But, Bull!' whined Wallace. "'They'll blast us out of space!' Coxine roared into the mic. The first one of you yellow crawlers that tries to run for it will be blasted by me. Man your guns, I said. This is our big chance. Wipe out the Solar Guard now, and the Solar Alliance is ours for the asking. Fight, men, fight! Tom, Roger, and Astro looked at each other, mouths open, not knowing whether they should laugh or not at the dramatic speech of the huge spaceman. But whatever the private feelings of the criminals, Coxine had roused them to fever pitch, and the boys could hear them racing through the Avenger, preparing to fight the squadrons of solar guard ships bearing down on them. Coxine strapped himself into the pilot's chair and began barking orders to his battle stations, whipping his men into action relentlessly. And then suddenly Captain Strong's voice, vibrant and firm, came over the audio receiver, demanding the surrender of the pirate captain and his fleet. Never, roared Coxine. You'll get my surrender from the barrels of every blaster I have under my command. Then, replied Strong, I have no alternative but to attack. With a coldness that reached across the void of space and gripped their hearts with icy fingers, the three cadets heard the skipper give his squadrons the deadly order. Fire! Coxine snapped his order at almost the same instant and the three cadets felt the Avenger shudder as her turrets began blazing away, returning round for round of the deadly atomic missiles. Racing from scanner to the control panel and back again, Coxine watched the battle rage around him. With speeds nearing that of light, exhaust trails cut scarlet paths through the black space as the two opposing fleets attacked, counterattacked, and then regrouped to attack again. The rhythm of the blasters on the Avenger had taken on a familiar pattern of five-second intervals between bursts. Gradually, one by one, the pirate ships were hit, demolished, or badly damaged, but still they fought on. Coxine, his eyes wild with desperation, now kept lining up ships in his radar sights and firing, with no way of knowing which was friend and which was foe. Tom, Roger, and Astro watched the dogfight on the scanner in horrified fascination. Never before had they seen such maneuvering, as the giant ships avoided collisions sometimes by inches. Once, Tom tore his eyes away from the scanner when he saw a rocket destroyer plow through the escaping swarm of jet boats after one of the pirate ships had been hit. Fire and change course, fire and change course, again and again, Coxine performed the miracle of escaping the deadly atomic blasters aboard the Solar Guard ships. Suddenly the three cadets saw the outline of a rocket cruiser bearing down on them. The white blip on the scanner came closer and closer to the heart of the scanner. Just in time, Coxine saw it and shouted for a course change. But even as the Avenger swung up and away from the attacking ship, the cadets saw the flash of flame from the cruiser's turrets, and a moment later felt the bone-rattling shudder of a near miss. The control deck suddenly filled with smoke. A flash fire broke out in the control panel, and the circuit sparked and flared. Tom was thrown across the room, and Roger landed on top of him. "'Up ninety degrees! Full starboard thrust!' roared Coxine into the intercom. "'Hurry, you space crawlers! We've got to get out of here!' Tom quickly realized that in the smoke and confusion, Coxine couldn't possibly direct the ship back into the fight. There was only one explanation. He was deserting his fleet and trying to escape. And then, over the noise and confusion, 
Tom could hear the sound of struggling bodies, and Coxine muttering an oath between his teeth. I'll break you in two, you blasted space rat! There were more sounds of struggle, and Tom and Roger heard Astro's voice replying grimly. Do it, and then talk about it, big shot. Slowly the smoke cleared from the control deck, and Tom and Roger strained their eyes to see through the thick cloud. There, in front of them, stood Astro, torn strands of rope dangling from his arms, in mortal combat with Coxine. The two giants were holding each other's wrists, their feet spread apart, legs braced, grimacing faces an inch apart, struggling to throw each other off balance. Tom and Roger watched the two huge spacemen brace against each other, muscles straining and faces turning a slow red as they tried to force the other's hands back. Suddenly, with the speed of a cat, Coxine stuck out his leg and kicked Astro's foot from the deck, tripping him. Astro tumbled to the deck. In a flash, the pirate was on top of him, gripping him by the throat. The Venusian grabbed at the hands that were slowly choking the life out of him and pulled at the fingers, his face turning slowly from the angry flush of a moment before to the dark gray hue of impending death. Still bound and tied by the heavy rope, the two cadets on the deck were helpless as Astro's strength slipped from his body. Tom turned to Roger desperately. We've got to do something. What? I can't get loose. The blond-haired cadet struggled against the ropes until the blood ran down his lips, but it was a hopeless effort. Yell, said Tom desperately. Yell! Make a noise! Holler like you've never hollered before. Yell? asked Roger stupidly. We've got to distract him. Tom began to bellow, and immediately was echoed by Roger. They shouted and screamed. They kicked their feet on the deck and tore against their bonds. Astro's hands no longer fought the powerful fingers taking his life. There was no strength in the cadet's hands now. But in the split second that Coxine turned to look at Tom and Roger, he gave a mighty heave with the last of his great strength and tore free of the pirate's grasp. The Venusian jumped up and ran to the farthest corner of the control deck, gasping for breath. Coxine rushed after him, but Astro eluded him and stumbled to the opposite end of the control room, still trying to suck the life-giving breath into his screaming lungs. Slowly his strength returned. Coxine made another headlong rush for the cadet, but this time Astro did not attempt to get away. He stood squarely to meet the charge, and his right fist caught the pirate flush on the chin. Coxine staggered back, eyes wide with surprise. In an instant Astro was on him, pounding his mighty fists into the pirate's stomach in any place he could find an opening. Roaring like a wild animal, the cadet no longer fought for the honor of the Solar Guard or his friends. He didn't look upon the criminal in front of him as Coxine the pirate, but as a man who had nearly taken his life, and he fought with the ferocity of a man who wanted to live. Again and again, Tom and Roger saw their unit mate pound straight, powerful, jolting lefts and rights into the pirate's midsection, until they thought he would put his fist completely through the man's body. Just as Caxine looked as if he would fall, he suddenly charged in again. But his powerful strength restored, Astro stepped back and waited for an opening. Coxine threw a whistling right for Astro's head. The Venusian ducked, shifting his weight slightly, and drove his right squarely into the pirate's face. His eyes suddenly glassy and vacant, Bull Coxine sank to the deck, out cold. Breathing heavily, the cadet turned, wiped his face, and smiled crookedly at Tom and Roger. "'If I ever have to fight another man like that again,' gasped Astro, as he loosened the ropes around his unit mates, "'I want to have both fists dipped in lead before I begin.' He held up his hands. There was not a bit of flesh remaining on his knuckles. As soon as Tom was free, he grabbed the pirate's parallel ray gun. "'We'd better tie this crawler up,' he shouted. We'll do that, said Roger. You try to figure out how we're going to get off this ship. Suddenly, behind them, the hatch burst open, and Captain Strong rushed into the room, followed by a dozen armed guardsmen. Captain Strong! yelled the three cadets together. The young captain's face lighted up with a smile. He rushed over to Tom and grabbed him by the hand, then turned to where Roger and Astro were tying up Coxine. Strong pointed his gun at the fallen pirate. What happened to him? Roger smiled and nodded toward Astro. Coxine told Astro he reminded him of an ox he saw at a zoo once on Venus. Astro got mad. Roger shrugged his shoulders. Poor Coxine. He didn't have a chance. Astro blushed and looked up at Strong. Never mind us, sir, said the big cadet. How did you get here? 
Strong told them of having picked up the beacon signal. That was quick thinking, boys, he said. It was the end of Coxine. If we hadn't stopped him now... Strong shook his head. But how did you get aboard the Avenger, sir? asked Tom. This was the only ship that wasn't a Solar Guard fleet vessel, so it was easy to spot. We captured the Polaris right off the bat, and after we searched it, figured you three were either dead or aboard this one. I gave the order not to fire on you, since we wiped out Coxine's fleet before he could do any real damage. When we saw you accelerating, after that last near miss, which incidentally was intended to miss you, we came alongside, forced the airlock open, and took over. But didn't the crew offer any resistance? asked Roger. No and from the story they tell me about Coxine wanting to establish a new order, or something like that, they were glad to surrender. They think he's crazy. When the enlisted men carried Coxine, still unconscious, off the control deck, the three members of the Polaris unit and their skipper watched him leave silently. All of them realized how close the Solar Alliance had come to destruction at the hands of the insane pirate. Finally Strong turned to his crew of cadets. Well, boys, he said wearily, we've recovered the adjustable light key and captured Coxine. I guess that finishes the space pirates. Yes, sir, said Tom quietly, and this sure teaches me a lesson. What's that? said Strong. Never to think that being a space cadet is a matter of learning something from a story spool. Being a space cadet is like being, he stopped, like nothing in the universe. End of chapter 20 End of On the Trail of the Space Pirates by Carrie Rockwell